In this video, we're going to do an example of how we might use a rotational spectrum to calculate a physical constant for a molecule. So let's say we have some rotational spectrum here of carbon monoxide, which we've measured through some types of experimental means. And we have a bunch of lines here on this microwave spectrum, or it could be also rho vibrational spectrum, which would be in the infrared region, but the spacings between these levels are in the microwave region. And we want to use this to figure out what the bond length is in carbon monoxide. So we can carefully measure and see that the spacing between two adjacent lines is 3.8626 wave numbers, or inverse centimeters. So how can we use this to determine what the bond length is? Well, the first thing to notice is that this constant here, this spacing between these uh, two peaks there, is equal to 2 B bar, 2 times the rotational constant for that molecule. And thus we know that B bar is going to equal 3.8626 divided by 2 is 1.9313 wave numbers. Okay, and then we can use this in conjunction with what we know the value of B bar is equal to B. We know that B bar is equal to Planck's constant over 8 pi squared times speed of light that's how it converted from hertz frequency into wave numbers, inverse centimeters, times I, the moment of inertia for the molecule. But we also know that I, the moment of inertia, equals mu L squared, the reduced mass of these two atoms times the bond length squared. So that means we can say that this also equals H over 8 pi squared c mu l squared. So now we want to re rearrange this equation to get it to where we have l on by itself on the left side here. So you should be able to convince yourself that this would be, well first we would have l squared would just be h over 8 pi squared c mu b bar and this would be L squared, and so we would take the square root of that to get L. So all we need to do is find all of these values and then um, get the take the square root of them and get L. H is Planck's constant, we know that. We know 8 pi, we know the speed of light, we know that rotational constant. What about this mu, this reduced mass? Well, that from all of the other videos in the playlist which we've discussed is the product of the two masses of the atoms over their sum, m1 times m2 over m1 plus m2. But what mass should we use? Now the important thing is that uh, this spacing is going to be different. You're going to have a different reduced mass if you have different isotopes for carbon and for oxygen. So it's important to pick a specific uh, isotope for each atom in this diatomic molecule when you're calculating this uh, rotational constant here and, see, and remembering which spectrum it is for. So I'm just going to say that this is C12 and O16. So we're going to move forward with that kind of idea. So we're going to say that mu equals 12 AMUs, 12 atomic mass units is the mass of carbon 12 and we say it's 16 for oxygen over 12 plus 16, and that's atomic mass units. And we can then say that mu is equal to, this is going to simplify out eventually to 48 sevenths of an AMU, and that's equal to 48 sevenths of an AMU, one atomic mass unit, which is a twelfth of a carbon-12 atom, or effectively the mass of a proton or a neutron, is going to be 1.661 times 10 to the minus 27th kilograms. So that's the other thing we want to make sure of, is that we've got all the proper units for everything in here. So let's go ahead 
and substitute that down into L down here. Make a very long line, because this could potentially be very long. If I'm explicitly writing things in here, I can't write very small in here, especially if I've got exponents. So Planck's constant, 6.626 times 10 to the minus, minus 34th joule seconds over 8 pi squared. Speed of light is 2.998 times 10 to the what unit do we need it in? We're given inverse centimeters here, so we need the speed of light in centimeters per second. So it's 10 to the 10th centimeters per second there. It would be 10 to the 8th if it was in meters per second. The reduced mass is 48 over 7 times the atomic mass unit, 1.661 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. And then finally, our value of B bar, which was half of the distance between adjacent peaks, is 1.9313 wave numbers, or inverse centimeters. And we need to take the square root of everything in here. So when you punch that into a calculator, just make sure that you're being careful to uh, take the appropriate uh, exponents, make sure you're div dividing and multiplying the proper things. That's a very big denominator, so it might help to store some intermediates on the way there. But if you put that into your calculator carefully, what you should end up with is that the length of this bond, once you go through all of the algebra, you should get back 1.128 times 10 to the minus 10th meters. It's a very bad m. Times 10 to the minus 10th meters. And we also know that 10 to the minus 10th meters is one angstrom. And angstroms are a convenient unit for uh, chemical bonds because chemical bonds are usually on the order of, of a few angstroms, on the order of one angstrom or so. So the length we would get is 1.128 angstroms. So this example I just cooked up by uh, multiplying the value of B bar, which has been experimentally determined for carbon monoxide by two. So this is the actual value of B bar in spectroscopy tables, if you see it for, for this isotope of carbon monoxide. And when we use this idea, which th the idea that this spacing equals this rotational constant that's what we got from the energy levels of the rigid rotor system. So this is, this is a prediction of quantum mechanics that this bond length is 1.128 angstroms if you have a microwave spectrum which has these distances between the peaks here in wave numbers. And how does that prediction stack up once we compare it to the experimental bond length of carbon monoxide as determined by other methods? Well, that is correct to every digit we have reported it. We only used about four sig figs in most of our, uh, in most of our uh, con physical constants there, but this bond length is correct to four sig figs. And this is the real power of microwave spectroscopy is some of the most uh, valuable data for determining the bond length of molecules came from uh, rotational spectroscopy, both row vibrational and microwave. In the, in the early days of chemistry in the first half of the 20th century. So this is a very strong validation of the use of the rigid rotor model and, and for quantum mechanics as well as applied to chemistry that you, using the, this value of B bar, which we derive purely from quantum mechanics, comparing it to this value which we measure in experiment, you get a prediction which is pretty much dead on with the experiment. So, that is, that is the power of quantum mechanics as applied to uh, rotating diatomic molecules. So in subsequent videos, now we're going to take a little bit of time and look at what are the corrections which can go uh, beyond just the perfectly rigid rotor model. How does it couple between uh, higher, higher energy levels for rotation and how does it couple between vibration as well? What are the deviations from a perfectly rigid rotor?